this passage, I hope today, as we go through this message this morning, uh, that you will pay close attention to the words of the Apostle Paul. We've literally been going verse by verse through the book of Ephesians. And I hope that as we read this passage today, that you will just ask God to speak to your heart specifically. It's not an accident you're here. How many times have I said that to you? Amen. It's not an accident that you're here. But it is by God's design, he knew you would be here today. And so he has a message for us. Stand with me and let's read from Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and I want to begin in verse 15, and then Brother David will pray for us. It says this, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. I think we can say amen right there. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melodies in your heart to the Lord. Notice verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he concludes by saying, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Brother Dave, would you come and lead us in our prayers? Seated. I'm going to ask you to, uh, to keep on track here, uh, the passage that we have read this morning, uh, because there's a lot to be said in this passage. When I say there's a lot to be said, I mean there is a lot to be said. You know, one thing that we find constantly with the Apostle Paul and his writings is that uh, many of his letters, they provide us guidance. Guidance for good old day-to-day -day living. We never read the letters of the Apostle Paul without coming to this conclusion. I may have not necessarily learned something new, but I've certainly learned the way that I should live. Amen. And I've certainly learned some things that I should not do in my life. Every word that was inspired by the Apostle Paul that God himself had given him, I want you to understand something. It was not only for our betterment, but sometimes it is for our chastisement. Sometimes it is for our correction. And so today, the Apostle Paul says several times that we should be a certain way. Think about that for just a moment. Be a certain way. Paul doesn't say we should do certain things. What does he say? He says that we should be a certain way. Now, my question to you is, why does he make this distinction in the passage that we're looking at today? What's the difference between being and doing? I want to tell you, I've heard a lot of bad theology on those two words right there, being and, and doing. But when Paul tells us to be a certain way, he's talking about our attitude. He's talking about who we are. He's talking about habits that you and I need to adapt and adopt in our lives. Any of you ever met somebody that just kind of had an attitude problem? Let's be honest this morning. Let's get this thing started off right. Uh, well, let me ask you, might sit next to somebody that's got an attitude problem. Maybe that, there we go. We got some fingers pointing now. This thing started off right this morning, all right? Well, I get back to this idea of Paul saying, listen, folks, we need to have this certain specific attitude, and we need to build these habits in our lives. He's talking about being, and he's talking about doing. Now listen to this. Being always leads to doing. Did you get that? Being always leads to doing. I want you to think about your specific walk with God today. How much of your time do you focus on doing things for the Lord? You may say, I've done this, and I've done that. And you can give a whole list of things that you have done. And as Christians, what do we do? As children of God, we do and we do and we do and we do. Did you know that sometimes God wants us just to be? Not necessarily to always do, but sometimes we have to just be. Now you 
may be saying, well, I'm confused now. I don't even know where you're uh, beginning to go with this. That's the idea. Confuse you in the beginning, so you got to stay for the end. That's a good philosophy. <laughs> what does it mean to stop doing and just be? Let me get back to my original uh, point that I was making here, and that is that there is an unbreakable connection between being and doing. Does the Bible tell us that we should do certain things? Of course God's Word tells us we should do certain things. But Paul tells us today that we should simply be. You know, I don't know how you feel about this, but one sustains the other. Being sustains doing. Ask yourself a question like this. Do I want to be generous? Then what must I do? I must practice generosity, right? I must do generous things. Do I want to be compassionate as a Christian? Well, how do I become compassionate? By doing compassionate things. Do you see the connection there? Whenever we talk about those things, there is an unbreakable connection between being and between doing. The more you do as a Christian, the more you'll be as a Christian. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying you can do enough things to earn your salvation. I'm not saying anything like that at all. But here what we have in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul tells us to be a certain way. To, when he says be, he's given us a very spiritual principle here, here. He says do these things again and again and again in your life that they almost become habit in your Christian life. Now, that brings us to our text this morning that I just read a few minutes ago. And I want you to follow along here because it doesn't matter what I think and it doesn't matter what I say. It matters what God's Word says, and that's what we are to believe. Amen. And so today what we're going to find is there's three actions, three specific actions that we must repeat and we must build our lives upon. And Paul mentions all three of them in this passage. Here they are, number one, and this is a very simple one on the surface, it is to be careful. It's the first thing the Apostle Paul tells us. He says, as a Christian, as a believer, as a true saint of God, that you have to learn to be careful. Now, look at verse 15, if you would. Verse 15 in Ephesians chapter 5, here's what he says. He says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Circle that phrase there, see then. Because do you know what Paul was telling us to do when he says, see then? He's saying, be careful. He's saying, be cautious. Simply put, Paul is telling us as a child of God that you and I need to pay attention to how we live. Not only how we live, but we need to pay attention to the way uh, things are around us. I mean, when you tell someone to be careful, what are you telling them? You're telling them to pay attention. You're telling them, look. You could be facing danger. You're saying, look, there's some important things that you might encounter. And so right from the very beginning, Paul instructs us, and he's saying, okay, so you all say that you're a child of God. This is where you need to begin. You need to begin by being careful. It's the exact point that the Apostle Paul is making. Why does he say that? Well, look at verse 16. He goes right into this as he's talking about this, and he says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Right. Now he answers a question right there. Would you agree? Uh, why do I need to, as a Christian, be careful? Because the days in which we are living in are days where there are evil things that are going on. Boy, I don't know about you, but anytime I am very comfortable with uh, the tri-state area. I go anywhere around here and I feel comfortable. I know the community, I know the, the people, I know my surroundings, and I feel pretty good. Is that how you are when you kind of go around? I, I'm not always on guard, watching all the time, I'm not paranoid. But you get me about 50 miles away, and it's a whole different world. Man, I'm holding on to my wallet, I'm watching constantly, I won't let my kids get, you know, 10 yards away from me. Because I'm always cautious and I'm always careful when I'm away from surroundings that I'm comfortable with. Well, you say, well, what's the point that you're trying to make here? The same point that the Apostle Paul is making in our Christian life. We're living in a world 
We're living in a sinful world, a world that wishes to do us harm, even. And Paul says that as a believer, you need to be careful. Now, how does that apply to my life as a Christian? Honestly, I wake up every day. I may not feel threatened as far as my life is concerned. But here's the way Satan works this thing out in our life. See, there's decisions that you'll make today. There's decisions that you'll make this week. Uh, maybe you want to uh, cut some ethical corners and it's not that big of a deal. You know what Paul would say to us as a Christian? He would say, be careful. Yes. That one little thing that you will do can lead to some bad things in your life. And he's saying, be careful. Don't go down that road. Right. Be careful. Amen. Someone at work may just come up to you and say something a little flirtatious to you. And you say, well, I trust myself. Do you know how many times I've heard people tell me that? I trust myself. I'm not worried about them. I trust myself. Do you know what Paul says to us as Christians? Be careful. Be careful in the way that you live. Be careful in the things that you do. And you come home and you're just on edge. You better be careful. Because one conversation, one word could determine your entire night that night. You better be careful <laughs> the things that you say. Paul is telling us, be very careful. He's telling us, pay attention. Now remember this also. Scripture teaches us that Satan is like this a roaring lion. You've heard me say this hundreds of times. Satan is this roaring lion. And what does he want to do? He wants to devour us. He wants to destroy us. So is it, it shouldn't be unreasonable that Paul would say to us as Christians, we need to be careful because that is our enemy. We know our enemy, and he's telling us to be careful. That's the first action as a Christian we need to take. Sure. There's a second action that Paul mentions in this passage, and it's found in verse 17, and that is to be perceptive. Not just to be careful, but I know I'm a child of God, and I have to be perceptive. Look at verse 17, if you will. He said, Wherefore, be ye not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, usually when we talk about God's will for our life, you know what we're talking about? We're generally talking about those big things in our life. God, I want to know your will and who I am supposed to marry. God, I want to know your will if I'm supposed to buy this house. God, I want to know your will in, in my career. And I want to know your will if this is the church that I should attend. But that's not what the Apostle Paul is getting at in this passage. He's referring here to what God wants to do with us on a daily level. In other words, the way God wants us to live, day in and day out. Paul's reference in verse 17 to understanding the will of the Lord is not so much about the big picture, but it's the dailies, the daily things that we do, understanding what God's will is for us on a daily uh, basis, the individual scenes of our life. You know, it does no good for us as a Christian to have great visions for our life. Everybody wants to have a great goal and a great big vision for their life. That's fine, but if we don't know what God wants us to do on a daily basis, what difference does that grand vision even make in our life, in our day-to-day -day process? We need to understand that God has a will for every scene in our life. Oh, God has a general will. The Bible tells me that it's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God, God wants, God desires that all men would be saved. The man has a choice in that. We know that. But God desires. He, he doesn't want to see anyone go to hell. God desires that they be saved. But you realize God has a specific will for your life. And I'm talking about the little things in your life. You say, well, that's, that's just nonsense. Surely Paul is not speaking about that. Well, think about this. Today, when you leave here, you're probably, most of you, are going to go out to eat. Does God have a will and a plan for my life this afternoon? You better believe it. In fact, you better believe and pray, God, whoever you put in my path, whoever you put in my way, Lord, I want to make sure that I'm doing your will. It'll change your conversation you have with that waiter. Ooh. It'll change the conversation you have with your spouse and with your family. If every day we're constantly seeking God's will in the specifics of our day-to-day -day life, would you believe that God wants you to have specific, uh, Christocentric, uh, gospel-centered uh, conversations with people today? Absolutely. 
God does. God wants us to share the gospel with others today. He wants us to uplift people today. Christ wants us to let others see Christ in us today. There's no doubt about it. You don't even have to pray about it. That is God's will for our life today. The question is, what are we going to do with that? Even though maybe nothing, nothing worth shattering is going to take place this afternoon, I think God still wants us to recognize that the little things in our life can impact our life. Yeah. Where I think about that, think about the one conversation that you may have with somebody about Christ that could change their entire perspective and could change their entire life. The first action Paul mentions is be careful in this world. And then the second action Paul mentions is be perceptive. Every day is a gift from God, so use it to the best of your ability. Now, there's a third action that Paul mentions here, and this is a fun one, and that is to be filled. What is he talking about when he says be filled? Well, we have to go to verse 18 to see exactly what he says. And in verse 18 of Ephesians 5, Paul says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein it excess is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, did you get that? This command... Now, some will disagree with this, and that's okay. But this command indicates that when it comes to being spirit-filled, the ball is in your court. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can be filled with as much of the Spirit of God as you want to be filled with. It depends upon you. It depends <laughs> upon your activity. And you say, well, how? I want to be filled with the Spirit of God. I want to tell you what. You're not going to be filled with the Spirit of God down at the bar. You're not going to be filled with the Spirit of God when you're out gossiping and you're out uh, having some righteous living. You say, well, how do I become filled with the Spirit of God? Listen, the day that we accepted Christ as our Savior, do you know that the Holy Spirit of God lives within us from that very moment? That's right. And He never leaves us. <laughs> but we're talking about being filled with His Spirit. Here's how. You ask, you yield, and you receive. Ask, yield, and and receive. You ask God every day, God, fill me with your spirit. I want to be more like you. Lord, I want to be more like Jesus every day. And then we yield ourselves to him. That's a daily process. As the day goes on, we yield ourselves to Christ and we surrender to his will. That means that conversation you have today, it can either be a very Christ-like conversation or an unlike Christ-like conversation. Praying, God, fill me with your spirit and use me today in my conversations and my encounters is one thing. Yielding yourself to Christ is another, and surrendering to that will is another thing. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25, the Apostle Paul said it like this. He said, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Now that's just good old King James. We're saying if you're going to walk, or going to talk the talk, walk the walk, Right? That's a good way to look at it there. So after Paul tells us to be filled with the Spirit, he then tells us what to do about it. Now look at verse 19 and 20 in our text today because this is some good instruction that he gives us here. He would say to us, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord, verse 20, giving thanks always, for all things unto God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now very quickly, <clears throat> I want to just give you some components here of being spirit-filled. This is not a difficult thing to understand, but if you understand these components, I think it makes it very simple. Component number one, how do we speak to one another? Why does Paul mention time and time again as we have studied in the book of Ephesians about the way that we speak to other people. Listen, when you are spirit-filled, you will speak to people differently. People will be able to tell that you are actually spirit-filled and filled with the Spirit of God and not Satan. There's a distinct difference there. And this is absolutely crucial to our spiritual health. You see, you cannot continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit if you speak anger and you speak words of hate, and you speak words of resentment, and you speak words of bitterness. And by the way, those things have no place at all in the church of God. 
We need a church that is filled with the Spirit of God and that is unified and that is loving and that is encouraging and helping people in their walk with God. Amen. Now James nailed this down in James 1.26. He said, If any man among you seem to be religious and bright of mind his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. It goes back to if you're going to talk the talk, then you're going to have to walk the walk. So that first component is how we talk to other people. Component number two. And Paul would mention our worship. This is more about, more than just about attending Sunday morning service. It's about a life that is directed to God. Look at verse 19. Would you real quick in verse 19 in chapter 5 of Ephesians? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's an important part of that verse there. In your heart to the Lord. Have any of you ever said in church, well, I already know the answer to this question, but have you ever said in church and a soloist gets up to sing? Now, let me preface this by just saying this. I've been in church all my life. I, unlike my granddaughter, I was in the church from the day that I was born. Okay? And I just throw that out there. I have been in church my entire life. And I've seen it all. I've been in good services. I've been in bad services. I've been in spirit-filled services. I've been in some services, uh, some services that I'm telling you folks, it would scare some of you to death. It didn't bother me at all. If it's of God, then have at it. But have you ever sat in a service and a soloist got it the same? And just about every other note that they hit was just off. And it didn't want to make you say, praise the Lord. It wanted to make you say, ooh, ooh. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. That happens occasionally. Do you realize that same illustration? The reason I give that illustration is because we can do that same thing in our worship to God. Sometimes when our, our heart's not right and we're not right and we're just kind of going through the motions, I seriously believe it makes God go, ooh. Something's not right there with them. They're just putting on this show. They're just kind of going through the motions. So Paul mentions this, and it makes us think about our worship. Now let me bring this to a close because there's a third component that I do not want us to miss, and that's where the challenge is going to come from this message today. Component number three, and that is simply giving thanks. It goes back to verse 20 of our text. He says, give thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know why that is difficult for many of us? Because we are so focused on the next thing that we're going to ask God for that we don't spend enough time thanking God for what he's already done. In our prayer life, think about that. We are so focused on, God, I need this, God, I need that, that we don't stop and say, God, I just want to thank you. If you never bless me with another thing, I want to thank you for what you have already given me. Now, here's what I want to challenge you to do this morning. I want you to make it a habit in your life to give God thanks for everything. And I'm not just talking about the mortgage being paid. I'm talking about everything. Yes, should you thank God for your house? Absolutely, if you have a roof over your head. But I think you also should thank God for the bed that you are sleeping in. And I think you should thank God for the slippers that is on your feet that's keeping your feet warm. I would even thank God for your toothbrush, that you're able to buy a toothbrush and brush your teeth. And of course, thank God that you have a coffee maker and you can get your day started right. <laughs> they said those are just little things. See, those are the things we become so comfortable with, the blessings of God, that we just focus not on the blessings, but we focus on what else we need. You know what this does? It helps you pay attention to God's presence in your life. When Paul says to you and I as a believer, be careful, be perceptive, be filled, he is giving us basic instruction on how to live. Can you use this as a checklist this morning and say, maybe I haven't been as careful in my walk with God as I should. I need to fix that. Perspective. Uh, maybe I have not thanked God enough as far as uh, his blessings in my life. And my perspective in my walk with God is not right. Being fit. 
I don't want to be a dead Christian. I want to be a lively Christian. I want others to see Jesus in me. Can you use this as a checklist this morning to see where you're really at in your walk with God? Listen, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, that's where it begins. That's where it all begins, is by committing your life to Him, asking Christ to forgive you of your sin, and starting your Christian walk today. If you need to do that, you come. We can pray and you can ask God to save you. Maybe today you just are looking at your own life and saying, I know it's not pleasing to God and it's not what it should be, and I want to be better tomorrow than I am today. And I encourage you to do that. Would you stand with me? Father, we thank you today so much. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that we have an opportunity to stand here and just to be able not only to preach from your word, but Lord, we thank you that we have an opportunity to live it out and allow your word to live out in us. And so God, I am asking today that each and every one of us that is standing in this building this morning would just take this opportunity to evaluate our own life, our own heart, and our walk with you. Lord, we need you today just like we needed you yesterday. But God, in some ways, we need you more than we've ever needed you before. So Lord, help us as Christians just to do our part. Help us to do our part to serve you, to love you, to worship you. Lord, help us to be cautious and to be careful in the world that we're living in because Satan wants us to fail. He wants us to stumble. Lord, put good people in our path. Put good churches in our path. Help us to get associated with a good Bible-believing church that we can learn from your word. Lord, I pray today that as we come to the conclusion of our service and it's time for us to make decisions today, Lord, I would just ask and pray that you would help each and every one of us to make it our desire to do your will today. We pray this in Jesus' name.